Hi, and welcome to the World Beyond Belief. Uh, my name is Paul Marco, and I'll be with you the entire time. With me today is Oli Damagard. Now, Oli Damagard is going around and he's doing exceptional work, and one evidence of that is that he just recently received the Prague Peace Prize for 2016. I think that's an amazing honor, especially since it's not for being an investigative, uh, I don't know, detective. It's for actually propagating peace. So I'm honored to have him here for that. Also, you people in the United States, Oli is going to be in the Dallas area in November. He's going to be a speaker at the JFK Assassination Conference, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more toward the end of the broadcast. But I want you to just welcome Oli Damagard back to the world beyond belief. Oli, it's a pleasure to have you here. The pleasure is mine, Paul, and the honor. Thank you. Now, what we talked about before was new information that you've uncovered regarding Martin Luther King. I'm really anxious to hear that. It's it's a combination of new and information that have been been available for years and years, but very few people have know about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I would credit uh, most of this to a fantastic person called doc, Dr. Uh, William Pepper, who has been the lawyer for James Earl Ray, the alleged uh, assassin of, of Martin Luther King, and also the lawyer for Sirhan Sirhan. The, uh, the guy who's accused of the assassination of Robert uh, Kennedy. And uh, William Pepper has spent some 39 years of his life looking into this more than anyone on this planet. So many of these things that we're talking about today is only thanks to him that it's come forward. Great. I also want to say that I think that uh, not a lot of people are aware that there was actually a trial in 1999. It was... Uh, it. Uh, <clears throat> there was uh, more than 70 witnesses that testified under oath. It was uh, during 30 days, more than 4,000 pages of transcripts uh, of evidence and, and testimonials and so on. And uh, this was um, to find out if there were actually was a conspiracy behind uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King. Yeah. It was on behalf of the King family. And uh, the jury came back after only 59 minutes, and their decision exonerated James Earl Ray, saying he was okay, he said he might have been found involved without knowing, not knowing me. Uh, but uh, the evidence showed that there was conspiracy, including uh, that included J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, Richard Helms of the CAA, the military, the Memphis Police Department, and organized crime. So this is a, a trial with uh, the sentence, and this, this is all legal. So James Earl Ray, unfortunately, he was already dead by then, but uh, has been legally uh, Exonerate. cleared as being the patsy. So that is not even an option. I, and I'm not going to go into so much the official story today either, but more into what actually happened as okay. far as... Uh, what has come forward so far. Great. So if it's okay with you, I would just uh, like to take you back into to the mid-60s and just give a historical point why uh, Martin Luther King was targeted. And also, uh, just to remind uh, your listeners that there was only some 60 days between the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy. This was, they were so close to each other. And both of them, very much uh, against the Vietnam War, uh, very much pro-peace, uh, pro-nonviolence, and so on. And I tell you, had Robert Kennedy uh, been allowed to live and gone forward, he would have been elected president. I mean, he was so popular. Oh, yeah. And had King left alive, uh, I feel quite strongly that he would possibly have been the vice president of the USA. And I tell you, had these people uh, been left alive, just like um, JFK, Malcolm X, the world we live in today would look nothing like right. it does today. So this is why it's so important to look into these crimes, because the people, the perpetrators that took care of them, it, are still in 
positions of power, even though many of them are dead, but their children and other generations and accomplices are still there running the show, driving this world into this deep, dark hole. So this is why I've devoted some 30 years of my life looking into these things and doing my best to expose what actually happened. Right. When you first mentioned the people that were involved in the uh, Martin Luther King murder, it sounded like a roster that you've given us before for the JFK murder. I mean, the same gang. You know? It is the same, the same, the same. Do you know all of these uh, uh, four assassinations, JFK, Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy happened under the presidency of, of Lyndon Bain Johnson. And it's almost like, uh, but people say, but how can they be connected? Well, if I said when, when Al Capone was the head of the mob in, in Chicago, a lot of people died. And it's very easy to, to understand, well, of course, Capone was put behind these things. When, when you put forward the evidence, people buy it straight off. But here, no, 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 they couldn't be. But I'll tell you, they were. And uh, JFK, the assassination of JFK, uh, in my humble opinion, was a coup d'etat in the U.S. and in, to a certain degree uh, to the Western world. And that power structure that took over that day, that very brutal death machine uh, that took over that day in November 63, have just stayed in power. They changed the, the nice cover, of, which is right. uh, the, the face of the president, but it's still the same structure behind it. And uh, so, why, why, oh why, king of all people? I mean, he, they, this was a man, a very peaceful man, right. and so on. Why was he such a threat? Well, I think most people know his, uh, I've been uh, uh, this, oh God, now I forgot the speech. Uh, no, I, I have one, a dream. It's like I have, I a, have a dream. Yeah. Sorry about that. No. It's really hot here. My head is spinning. I, I have a dream. That was uh, after the JFK assassination, the year after, and that was also at more or less the same time when he received the Nobel Peace Prize. He was also made, uh, named Man of the Year on the cover of Time magazine and so on. Right. And at that time, he was very focused on equal rights for the black population, uh, integration and so on. But over the years, he expanded and the more he expanded, the bigger a threat he became to the establishment. And in 67, uh, which was one year before he was assassinated, he did a very famous speech in the Riverside Church in New York, where he totally opposed the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. saying that, uh, that uh, the, the biggest terror perpetrator in the world, more or less, was the U.S. Army doing all of these things. Right. That put him in a very, very bad position uh, regarding these dark forces. And then he expanded uh, to uh, what he, he was planning to do, the Poor People's March to Washington, where he was planning to get somewhere between 30,000 and 1 million people to march to uh, Washington and just camp outside the government building saying, we are not moving until you change, right. until you make things change here. So, and what he wanted was distribute the wealth so that to, to, to know that uh, the rich, super rich should not be super rich, the super poor should not be super poor, right. but that there would be balance and, and harmony. And that, especially that the last thing, that was the thing that signed his death uh, warrant, I think. Yeah. But um, it seems like, or I know the fact that Baker Hooper, the head of the FBI, he hated King. He, I don't know why, but he hated him, hated him. And since the late 50s, he had kept uh, King under strict surveillance with wiretapping and cameras filming. 24-7, everywhere he was moving, the FBI was there. And they tried to do everything they could to discredit him, to start smear campaigns, to, they were behind bomb threats, uh, and, and Kane's home was bombed. 
Uh, he was shot at, he was stabbed, uh, not saying that it was the FBI behind right. these things, but there was this massive campaign trying to stop him. And uh, <clears throat> one of the people involved in trying to uh, to stop him as well was just like in, at, uh, in the JK presentation, a oil baron called H.L. Hunt, a Texas um, billionaire who is uh, and the most wealthy person in the USA. And he and um, J. Edgar Hoover had many different meetings in hotels all over the US where they were going through different options of how to stop uh, Martin Luther King. And Hans thought that he could stop him through his radio programs to totally uh, discredit him and so on. But J. Edgar Hoover all the time insisted, no, 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 the only thing that can stop this man is a bullet. So, sorry, please interrupt me at, at any point. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really amazing. The only thing that can stop this man is a bullet. That's that's our uh, our CIA director uh, J Edgar Hoover. That's an amazing statement. Uh, I don't know if you said that ex these exact words, but that was the thing that the only thing that would stop him was killing him. But that he was he was totally correct there because uh, uh, Dr. King he, he knew that he might die at any point in time. He was uh, you know especially he was that uh, day he was stabbed in the chest by a, a letter opener. There was this uh, woman that uh, that uh, just stabbed him. After he, he had this scar operation scar, it was uh, the 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 shape of a cross. And he said that every day when he was shaving, that cross reminded him that his time was limited, that one yeah. day, uh, and also he told his wife, Coretta, uh, when JFK was assassinated, he said, this is exactly what's going to happen to me. So he, oh. was, he was aware of it, and he knew the price, and uh, he was willing to pay it. And when he died, he was only 39. He was only 39 years old. This is so easy to forget. You know, these people were young. JFK was yeah. 46 and, and so on. They're not, uh, and to accomplish so much in, a, in such a short life. It's amazing, I think. I think it's amazing. All these guys, one was 39, one was 46. This is the thing that, that Martin Luther King was very aware that he was, uh, he, he, he saw himself as dead ready almost, you know, he knew that he was going to be killed. I mean, it was just a matter of time because these forces were so brutal that uh, he had accepted that thing and uh, he was willing to pay the price. And just uh, like we said before, he was only 39 years old, so young. And uh, also why I, I remember it, I just want to mention also that the King's family, he, off, even after uh, Martin was killed, uh, the violence continued against them. You know, his his younger brother, Aiken, who was found dead in the swimming pool a year after, the following year, just, he was also very, very young. And uh, when they pulled him out of the swimming pool, he had no water in his lungs. So, wow. and then a few years later, uh, Coretta and uh, the, the family, uh, Alberta King also, and, uh, which was the mother of Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King Sr. was in the church, and uh, Alberta was playing the organ, and this uh, lone crate guy, the Martin, totally mind control, you can see he looked totally out of his head, and he comes in and starts shooting inside the church and kills Martin Luther King's mother. So, wow. very, very brutal um, history around this family. They've gone through absolute hell. Wow, I, di I, didn't, um, know, I didn't know that a, a, a mind control person came in and killed his, mo his, his mother, right? His mother, Alberta, came. Yeah. They, they, some people suspect that he was possibly targeting Coretta. Uh, because she was a much bigger threat, yeah. but that he missed and, and hit Alberta instead. So, anyway, big tragedy. Oh, it really changed the face of that whole movement when he was killed. Uh, that was a strong movement. It was a see. Everybody was really in the mood. I, I lived through it. 
I went to those marches. Everybody was really in the mood to have something done about the civil inequities. I don't know. Our generation had heard about it, and we needed to do something now. And then when he switched to anti-war, we were all anti-war because the draft was going on. And I had, I, I probably had 10 friends I could name off the top of my head that were killed in that war. So we were really, really motivated. And he was really an inspirational leader. And when he was shot, um, it, was, it was just an amazing uh, tragedy and, and took the wind out of the sails of that whole movement. Yeah, and then when Robert Kennedy, some 60 days later, were, were knocked off as well, I mean, that just killed everything. Um, I think so it was very efficient. I mean, it was very, they, they succeeded in do, doing what they, they wanted. Right. Also, King was so central because he was sort of the figure in the middle of all these different organizations that was trying to accomplish uh, a change. But he was the central one. and. By killing him, the whole thing imploded, uh, you know, so it was a strategic killing. I would say that assassinations on this uh, level is sort of a last resort. It's quite messy to get away with, so they try to avoid it. But uh, at certain points in, in history, they, they just done it. And these are very brutal rogue elements in, in government. Right. That, uh, do you think, so, let me ask you a question, Oli, and this may be a little off the topic, but I want to kind of pick your brain on this. Do you think that if these, these what are the four staged uh, assassinations by the same group of groups, do you think if that would happen today, do you think the public would be more awake to it? What, what do you think? A lot more awake through the internet. A lot more, I would say. It, it's, a lot, it's far more difficult to get away with these things now, with, where people got cell phones and everybody's spreading information very fast. In those days, in '63 and so on, people were so naive. Oh yeah. And and uh, so this is why nobody. Has really looked, they, most people didn't look into these things. They just booked the official right. story and that was it. And I mean, to this very day, Tiran Tiran is still sitting rotting away in a prison, not being allowed parole or anything like that, even though he's totally innocent. And it's very easy to to prove that he's innocent because uh, when uh, for, when um, at the Ambassador Hotel. Uh, in early June 1968, when Robert Kennedy has just given his speech and he was on his way to uh, the presidency. He was led out and taken out through the, the kitchen at the ambassador hotel, which was very strange. But in the kitchen, Sirhan and was waiting for him. And uh, he went back to mind control as well. He's a very typical uh, example of how mind control is used. Anyway, he's standing there with a very strange smile on his face. And when Kennedy approaches, he pulls out a, a gun with eight bullets. He starts firing. As soon as he starts firing, people jumping, they wrestle him down on a steam table, grab the gun, and, and so on. So at no point he was closer than 1.3 meters. I think that's, a, what is that, like a, Four feet, four feet or yeah. five feet, something like that. And at all times, he was straight in front of Robert Kennedy. That all witnesses say the same. Right. So, of course, Robert Kennedy was hit all three times straight from the front. Uh, no, he was hit three times from the back and yeah. to the right. And the last shots were fired point blank when he was on his way down so that the hair was burned from his skull from the flame of the gun. So it's it does not take... Like I normally say, you know, more than an IQ of 10, which right. can, an IQ of 10 that can sort of tell the difference between hot and cold water. Right. It doesn't take much more than that to understand there must have been a second shooter. Also, when you hear the, uh, the audio recordings, uh, there's, it seems like there was somewhere between 12 and 13 shots fired. So even though the FBI managed to destroy thousands of photos from the evidence of evidence and from the crime scene and so on, uh, destroyed 
so many testimonies, didn't hear witnesses, harassed witnesses and so on. What does that tell you? There's a massive conspiracy behind it and that is not a theory. We're talking facts. And also this whole thing about destroying evidence or keeping it, um, uh, you know, kept away from the public eye right. for 50 years or 60 years, that is the act of a criminal mind <laughs> trying to cover their butt. We are the one who are employing them to protect us. Right. We should have access to this. Right. No, it's national security. Op that is absolute baloney. Yeah. National security, their security, that's it. Yeah, that's what and, it and why 50 years? Because then, by then, most people involved are dead. So they're on the safe side, you know. And then after 50 years, they just expanded with another 29 years or something like that. So in the end, nobody bothers. And also, all of this so-called evidence that would be released at that time will have been shredded and... and and so on. Right. Please understand that we're looking at super criminal elements that are slaughtering elected leaders of a country, of a nation. Right. And the population are just sitting nodding and saying, well, I'm, that didn't sound too good, or that was horrible, or oh, I know exactly where I was when the shots were fired. Who cares? Right. That is not the important thing. You live in a life now that is controlled by these forces. So that is the thing that is important. And it's time for us to break the spell and see what's going on so that we can liberate this world and make it become this beautiful place it's supposed to be. Right. So, so. if I go back in time, okay. It seems like this assassination was planned at least, not, maybe not in detail, but that they had the plan of taking King out from the late 60s, uh, 66, I mean. And uh, uh, there was a series of meetings where uh, they, they planned on finding the perfect Patsy. And they, they uh, uh, elected James Earl Ray. He was in prison at the time. He, he had robbed a, a supermarket, a grocery store. This guy, not super intelligent, a, a total failure as a criminal. I mean, I don't think he ever be committed a crime without being caught within 20 minutes. But he came from a family, you know, hillbilly yeah. uh, family, uh, where all of them, all, all his brothers and father, had been in jail or escaped from jail and so on. Right. So very easy to paint someone like, like that black. Hmm. Also, you could use the, the racist uh, right. element as a motive, even though he wasn't really a, a racist as far as I, I never heard him say anything negative about any African-American. But in those days, I mean, if you were not a racist in these, in these areas, you would be chased out or you would be uh, having a hard time and so on many times. So $25,000 was given to Clyde Tolson, who was the second in command of the FBI. He then took this money and gave it to the Memphis Godfather. His name was Russell Atkins, uh, the, the Dixie Mafia. Uh, which was in those days a very powerful mafia, even though many people haven't heard of, heard of it. But the godfather, Russell Atkins, then uh, he received the money and he then transported it to the Missouri, Missouri State Prison where James Earl Ray was. This money was given to the warden and they more or less let him out in a bread truck. I mean, they, they opened the door, they, you know, they covered his butt, they, right. everything and got him out there sweetly and safely. So he was let loose. And then it said that he went to Atlanta. He was picked up by his brother and then somehow later ended up in Montreal and in Canada. In Canada, uh, he was approached by someone he's always referred to as Raul. This uh, Raul person, which I believe might be a composite of three or four different people with actually the same first name. So I think that is maybe why uh, James L. Ray, who wasn't that clever, put them together as one to not point fingers directly, but at the same time trying to prove his innocence. 
Anyway, so he met up with this Raul in, in Montreal. This Raul person uh, wanted to uh, give him jobs, like run errands more or less, but, or drive stolen goods from one place to another, right. contraband, uh, and so on. He was given four different identities, uh, uh, passports, everything. Very odd because uh, the four identities he was given, all of these four people looked very similar to him, or at least similar, same age, same appearance, white people, and all of them lived within a mile and a half uh, radius in outside Toronto, I think, or Montreal, Montreal uh -huh. in the same neighborhood. So I think possibly what they were doing was uh, trying to create um, a multiple patsy you know, if it doesn't work with one guy, then we nail the other one. Yeah. If it doesn't, then option one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. Just like there were multiple uh, Lee Harvey Oswalds walking around in Dallas and so yes. on. So I think maybe these four people were uh, being prepared as patsies as well, just that we haven't heard of them because James Earl Ray took the fall. Took the fall. And bef about a month before uh, the assassination of King, uh, James Earl Ray even had plastic surgery on his nose and added a scar to his forehead, making him have the same scars on his right hand, on his uh, the tip of his nose, and on his forehead as the uh, identity he was using at the time, Eric Galt. So what was that all about? And this was Eric Galt. Uh, this individual was uh, a, a hunter from Rhodesia but also with a high security clearance on, for one of the companies in Montreal. So through these files, uh, the CIA or other agencies, uh, through the security clearance where they get a lot of detailed information, could very, very easily handpick these people and create a patsy that could be used or different identities that could be used in an operation like this. Amazing. So, sorry? Yeah, I, I'm just amazed at how detailed they are, even back then. I mean, now, I mean, patsies for the Boston bombing, you know, there's several patsies. We, we know the pattern. But even back then, they were preparing three or four patsies for this Martin Luther King assassination. Amazing. So these, these were the guys who knew how to do it. What we're looking at today are cheap copies, you know, very sloppy, no budget, no preparation, just pulled together like boom, 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 just for media, and that's how. Here we're talking about the real, uh, the real deal, you know. Yeah, the real so, deal. What you mean by the real deal is, is taking the time to set it up, have people and have the correct people in place a lot more carefully than they do nowadays. You know, they say a perfect CIA operation is the operation no one ever hears about. So I don't know how many things we have never heard about that yeah. we have not discussed. We haven't even seen that it was an assassination or it was whatever, because they were perfect. The things, it's only these that, that is slowly, slowly uncovering. But the ones that, are, that they're pulling off today, oh my God, at least the ones that are visible, these false flag crap operations mm -hmm. or, or state-sponsored uh, terrorists, you know, Allah Akbar, uh, all of these. Yeah. Uh, it's <laughs> just not good. Right. But back in those days, I mean, the JFK assassination, we're still confused after all of these years. It was a masterpiece from their point of view. And uh, multi-layered with super many different options with, with uh, total uh, decompartmentalization, uh, uh, what do you call it? Where nobody, nope. everybody right. only knew their own, own part, uh, the need to know chain totally compartmentalized and so on. The, these were very clever and but following the same kind of template. This is also why that once you start hearing about how they're pulled off, you can, you can start smelling the same smell. You can see the same right. color pattern appearing and so on. So anyway, so we had Ray on the loose uh, being directed up and down under control for about eight months before the assassination. And the last few months before the assassination, you will see that he starts appearing at the same locations as where Dr. King is. Uh, 
with his, with his group. So they were in Los Angeles and they were aiming when King was on his way uh, towards Memphis, where, where he was going to, no, sorry, towards uh, Miami, where he was going to uh, hold a, a big rally down there. Um, when he suddenly decided to go to Memphis instead due to a local uh, demonstration, a big demonstration, I am a man, a poor man's uh, demonstration, they suddenly, the, the plans were changed and suddenly the James Earl Ray was directed to Memphis as well. But when he was in LA, it seems like the plan was maybe to take him out there because they were in so much control of the LAPD and so on. You can see so many assassinations and horrible crimes have been carried out in Los Angeles because they have them by the balls there. Right. And they know they have the people in the key position and so on. But the, the hit on, on Robert Kennedy was all, already being planned. So two of them in the same city, very similar carried out would just be too much. So that is why they diverted it away from Los Angeles, I believe. Interesting. So anyway, um, a few months before, uh, in the beginning of, of uh, uh, 1968, there was also a meeting in the Appalachian, the upper New York state, where uh, Chicago mobster Sam Giancarna, together with uh, uh, Johnny Rosselli, these two people were very central in the JFK assassination. They met up with people from the FBI and the CIA. One of them, one from CIA, I believe was E. Howard Hunt, who was also very central in right in the JFK assassination. He was very central in the Watergate burglar and many, many, many other operations. Anyway, so uh, the CIA offered uh, Giancana $1 million to take care of King, but Giancana turned it down. Why he didn't, did, I don't know, but he turned it down. Maybe he thought this is too much first JFK, then Malcolm X, King right. as well, as well as we're gonna take out Robert Kennedy, just gonna, you know, just gonna burn around us and and right. uh, well, there was still there was still a certain amount of criminal justice going on there. I mean, people could get arrested, even high level people. I mean, it wasn't uh, wasn't like today where you know who's who's going to prosecute them. You know, we can show that uh, you know Clinton is connected with various murders now, recently. Uh, she just connected only because. Uh, they could contribute things that would uh, harm her presidency or her uh, chance for presidency. But there's mm -hmm. no, I mean, even if there was pretty solid evidence, there's really not a criminal justice system. Whereas back there, yes, they could have been brought to trial. Things could have been exposed. There was still enough uh, of American justice left to, uh, that's probably why they had to be better at it. I don't, I mean, when you look at the FBI, with J. Edgar Hoover in the, at the front, I mean, what what kind of justice are we talking about? Yeah, that you're is exactly a super right. criminal organization with him leading it. And uh, also, I just want to point out, so I don't forget it, that not long after these assassinations in the early uh, 70s, uh, suddenly J. Edgar Hoover died uh, of a heart attack, it said, in his bathroom. And then he had the same treatment as so many other people that were murdered. You know, a very quick, uh, he was cremated, uh, no autopsy, and just buried the guy, boom. Yeah. So I believe that he was taken out as well. I'm gonna look more into that. And then he was buried in a Freemason uh, temple. So that says a lot as well. Right. Anyway, but uh, the, in March and April of 1968, we're coming close now because on the 4th of April was the day when he was murdered. Uh, there was also um, a series of meetings uh, with, I quote, persons involved with the CIA and military intelligence in the Phoenix operation in Southeast Asia. Now, if you remember, we, had, we did one interview about Operation 40, super central in the JFK assassination. And uh, one of the, the people that led Operation 40 was a man by the name of Ted Shackley. He was also the operation chief of JM Wave, the big, biggest uh, CIA um, operation in the world in Miami. Mm -hmm. And he was later the head of Operation Phoenix in, 
in uh, Vietnam. So I would very much uh, suggest that the people that attended these meetings, if we look at them using the same team, Ted Shackley would have been one of them, perhaps even David Atlee Phillips. These were people you know, that were very much involved in Operation Mongoose uh, with the JFK assassination and so on. But this was like uh, Lyndon Bain Johnson, what he called Murder Incorporated, you know, like a, yeah. a, a tool of death that could be used against anyone. So when Sam Giancarna, uh, when he turned down this contract, it seems like uh, it was offered to Carlos Marcelo in Louisiana instead, and he accepted it. So Carlos Marcelo gave it to a man called Frank Liberto, uh, who was in Memphis. And uh, uh, like I said, maybe there were similar things set up, you know, for had uh, King arrived in Miami, I'm pretty sure there would have been a similar hit set up there with different people. But, you know, it's option one, two, three, four, and right. so on. But now we're talking Memphis. Because this was so not expected that he would so suddenly go to Memphis. Memphis was just totally out of the way. But there was this sanitary worker uh, demonstration that started there. And, and uh, Martin King just said, this is what we, this is the people we're fighting for. We need to go and support them. Hmm. So... Uh, he he came to Memphis and Memphis he was there once first and then somebody slipped him while he was giving the speech slipped him a note saying please come back here again so while he was uh, giving the speech he he saw the note and he said and I promise I will be back I don't know who gave that uh, note but it that could be one in his inner circle that was trying to get him back on location right. because. Memphis was the perfect site for this thing. Because the, the man who was in charge of both the police and fire department, Frank Holloman, used to work very, very closely to J. Edgar Hoover. So in just one person, you control both these two major uh, organizations. Right. And right opposite uh, the Lorraine Motel where he was killed, uh, where he was shot, was the fire station, fire station number two, that was filled with surveillance and so on later on. Amazing. So anyway, Frank Liberto, uh, he also called the fat man, he uh, took this contract and approached a former police uh, officer called, a uh, Memphis police officer called Lloyd Jowers. At that time, Lloyd Jowers had retired and he was the owner of a small restaurant called Jim's Grill, which was opposite the Lorraine Motel, the boarding room where James L. Ray rented a room was right uh, next to and above the Jim's Grill. Mm -hmm. So it was very close to, to that thing. And it, at uh, Jim's Grill, <clears throat> a series of meetings were once again arranged for planning this hit. So uh, Jowers was asked to find uh, shooters and what he did was he connect he contacted old uh, colleagues from the police department that he used to, to work with. And <clears throat> so the people that were there at these meetings were uh, a lieutenant, uh, Memphis Police Department Lieutenant Earl Clark. He died in 87, but he was a hunting buddy of, of Lloyd Jowers, and he was a super uh, good shooter. Many people thought for a long time that he was the actual shooter, but I think not and neither do William Pepper. Oh. Uh, another man, also a police officer, was called John Barger. And then there was a very central man called Merrill McCullough, who was an undercover Memphis Police Department officer. Later, the first black full uh, feathered uh, CIA agent in the USA after the assassination. And he was then as soon as the shots rang out, he was the one of the first who came up to uh, Martin Luther King. And you can see he's kneeling next to the body, trying to feel the pulse uh, and so on. Uh -huh. So at the same time, he was also infiltrating a group called the Invaders, which was a local, it, was, uh, it wasn't a local group, but it was a group where uh, they were not nonviolence, but they, they were 
supporting King is in trying to arrange this march, and they were staying at the Lorraine Motel as well. But these people were armed and so on, and he had uh, this uh, Marilyn McCullough had infiltrated that group as well. So as far as I've been able to track, he was paid both by the Memphis Police Department, the FBI, and military intelligence for doing this thing. Amazing. So uh, very interesting that he was there so close to the shots were fired and made there to make sure that King died there. You know, this, uh, we're going to come to that closer. And then there was a man called Frank Strausser, a man, uh, former uh, Vietnam veteran, a super excellent, the best shot in Memphis, super racist. Uh, I think he was KKK. He's still alive. And according to William Pepper, he is the one that fired the, the shot that uh, mortally wounded King from the bushes, not from the rooming house where uh, James O. Ray is said to have uh, rented the room. Anyway, so at some of these meetings, uh, this mysterious Raul was there as well, and he supplied the weapon to be used, not the weapon that was put forward as evidence that uh, they had James O. Ray right. drive to Birmingham and, and buy you know, Remington Game Master, absolutely not the same rifle that was then used uh, at the killing. But that was, they even had him go twice to the back to the shop and change the rifle i would say just to make sure that the shop owner would remember him you know also while all of these things happen uh raul gave uh james o ray two thousand uh, dollars to buy a ford Mus mustang a white ford mustang he didn't buy white he, he bought, bought a pale yellow one but uh, this is we're going to see that this car is very important as well in the whole thing Anyway, so FBI, who had done everything they could to keep uh, Martin King under total surveillance for since the late 50s, suddenly, 48 hours before the shooting, suddenly all of that was, was called off by J. Edgar Hoover personally. What does that tell you? So when the shots were fired, there was no surveillance at all, no recordings, no nothing like that, except for in the fire station and so on. It's standard. It is the same, the same as we see every time when these things happen. So, um, so, so what, what, you're, what, what you're saying is they let him go off of surveillance while the hit, while the hit could happen. It's yeah, like, so it wouldn't be recorded. Like for security standing down for the Kennedy thing. It's a normal operation. It's standard, and yeah. this is what we see as well. The day before and the day uh, of the murder, uh, all security things were pulled away from Dr. Kim. You know, he normally had a, a bodyguard that uh, that uh, voluntarily took care of him 24 hours when he came to Memphis and so on. And these were black officers that was uh, that were very happy to assist him. There were two outside the doors, uh, always you know escorting him in and out of the car, and so on. But this time they were called up and said, "Don't worry, security is taken up, uh, taken taken care of." Then there were uh, uh, black officers, uh, firemen. These people were called up. They were transported to other uh, fire stations and so also. Also, there were black uh, police officers that were told, uh, you know, uh, taken out of the, of the game so that there was absolutely no one there uh, with a, a black color skin to have any kind of loyalty or that could interfere. And so all of them were pulled away. Also, there were tactical uh, uh, squad cars uh, that was being pulled away. They normally circulated around the block where King was staying, where everyone was staying. But this morning, they were pulled by five blocks. And when asked who pulled back, who ordered this thing to be pulled back, the answer that was given immediately was reference Samuel Billy Kyles. This name you will hear many times here. So he was a, a local pastor and a friend of the, uh, a friend of the, uh, Dr. King, but also it's important to understand that King's inner circle everywhere, there were infiltrators, there were spies, wow. uh, FBI's uh, program, COINTELPRO, had just 
they were everywhere. And so King's driver, the owner of the motel, uh, so many people were being paid. And uh, uh, we would see that there's another person also very central in this, in his inner circle, a man by the name of Jesse Jackson, if you know this name. Jesse Jackson. Uh, who will also appear again. Very, very sad and awful to hear about, but this is the way it is. Uh, Samuel uh, Billy Kyles was uh, a paid informer for the local uh, Memphis Police Department. And also, <clears throat> the, there is a witness who saw that uh, the Dixie Mafia's godfather, Russell Atkins, he used to pay uh, money, uh, like bribes, mm -hmm. to different people to keep position. This, this money was also carried out by, or, or transported there by Clyde Tolson, who used to come to Memphis all the time, he even took tr two transatlantic trips together with uh, the godfather. I mean, here we have the number two in the FBI and godfather of the Memphis Mafia taking chance of land trips. I mean, <laughs> that's just mind blowing. <laughs> but anyway, this witness saw that there was these paperbacks that uh, filled with money that was uh, delivered to different people. And he said he saw bags with the name Samuel Blake and Jesse Jackson on these ones. So please keep these two names in. What are the two names, Jesse yeah. Jackson, and what was the other one? We. His name is Reverend Samuel Billy Kyles. Samuel Billy Kyles. Yeah. Okay. But the thing was that um, on the 3rd of April, the day before the assassination, uh, they were arriving uh, by plane to Memphis and they had arranged to stay at the Holiday Inn Hotel. But when J. Edgar Hoover heard about that, he started a whole national campaign in media saying, look at this leader. You know, he's saying, talking about boycotting businesses with white owners, and here he is staying at uh, white luxury hotels and so on. Right. So that, to avoid uh, problems regarding that, that made the King Group change hotel to the Lorraine Motel. You know, so they were playing totally in his, uh, his game without knowing it. And because the Lorraine Motel was one of the few hotels that allowed black people to stay there. And this was quite a famous hotel. You know, you had Otis Redding, Aretha Franklin, mm -hmm. uh, Nat King Cole, many of these, B.B. Uh, King used to stay there and so on. Actually, Otis Redding, song, uh, what is it called? Is it After Midnight or something like that? That was, uh, he, 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 uh, he wrote that song at the Lorraine Motel. Interesting. <laughs> Doesn't matter, but so the obvious choice was the Lorraine Motel. So they indirectly got King to choose that hotel by uh, mockering him in media. So they got him there. And then what happened then was that he had booked a room, 202, I believe it was, on the ground floor next to the, uh, next to the office of the Lorraine Motel, but sort of like in a, in a corner where they could reverse the car in, let him out, you know, so he only had like two, three steps and he was in the room. Two, three steps out, he was in the car and so on. Very good for security. No way of, for an attack from the outside or right. the chances much less so what happened was that they, there was a call made and the room was changed from 202 to 306 on the second floor balcony where the staircase was only on the outside of the hotel. So he needed to walk up the stairs, stay on the balcony, go into the room. This was absolutely center of the motel, perfect spot for a sniper attack, absolutely awful when it comes to security. So who made that change? Who made that call? And a witness that has under oath told William Pepper that he was standing next to uh, Russell Atkins, the godfather's wife, who received the call saying, we need to get him, we need to move him, please see to it. So she called somebody called O.C. Fields with the instruction, please get Jesse, in this case, Jesse Jackson, to move him, get him up on the second floor. And according to this witness, 
Jesse Jackson was the one that made the arrangements with uh, Walter Bailey and Laureen Bailey, the owners of the hotel, get him up on the second floor. They said that that was the, from the request of, of Martin King himself, but um, uh, the owner was very much against it because he said it's very dangerous to put him up there, but no, he insisted. So according to this witness, it was Jesse Jackson who got King up on the second floor. Very crucial in the whole thing. Well, Jesse Jackson probably benefited from Martin Luther King's assassination more than any individual because he, more, he just came right into place there. More than anyone. And the thing is that he was somebody that King had taken on his wings, but the last few, I think about five weeks before his death, King was getting very upset with, uh, with Jesse Jackson and the relationship was very, very cold. And according to inside sources, uh, Jesse Jackson was very afraid of being exposed and was hurrying the thing up saying, we need to get this going before he blows my cover, you know? Very interesting, because Jesse Jackson always struck me as being totally controlled, whereas Martin Luther King was not. I mean, to me, from a casual yeah, observer. I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to be the deliverer of bad news. And please, Ms. Mr. Jesse Jackson, come on this program or whatever other program and uh, and tell your version of what happened or answer some questions about these things that we're going to talk about. Anyway, so the night before, <clears throat> uh, he uh, it was a very, the weather was very bad, there was a thunderstorm and so on, and King delivered this very, very famous I've been to the mountain top speech. Right. This was his stuff. Speech. And in that speech, he points out that his absolute best friend is Ralph Abernathy, Reverend Al, Al, yeah. Ralph Abernathy, who was the natural successor after him, had he not been killed. Uh, because uh, even though Jesse Jackson would be put forward as the one that was meant to take over after him, he, he was not. And I think maybe King suspected that something was going to go down because in his speech, you can hear his speech, he says, I might not go, you know, I've seen the promised land, I might not be able to get there, get there with you. together with you. Longevity has its, uh, its benefits, but I don't know if I'm going to make it together with you. And he said, at this point, I fear no man, I fear no one, and because I've seen him on the top and hallelujah, more or less like that. So I think he indirectly spoke to these forces as well, given them the finger saying, I do not fear you. I know what you're up to. You cannot stop me. And if you will, if you try to stop me, you will create a martyr that will be unstoppable. I have seen a mountain top, right. you know, and this cannot be stopped. I think that is what he said. And when he turns around, you can see also that he almost turns his back towards Jesse Jackson. It's the same when they arrive to the Lorraine Motel, it's filmed there. Jesse is opening the door, but his face is very brutal. If you, if you see uh, these things that were going on, he, he's, he's, uh, he's with his back towards King. King looks very, th there's not a peaceful, jolly feeling to these uh, images at all. Anyway, so... Well, uh, Jesse, I think Jesse was really hooked on, onto uh, success, notoriety. I think that's always in his forefront. Nowadays, the role he plays is whenever there's a racial conflict, and usually in the United States now, they're, you know, George Soros and his Black Lives Matters, and they're... They're creating more and more racial. Anytime there's a racial conflict, he'll show up there and he'll stoke the, the you know, the racial the racial card. So he's playing his uh, he's playing a real defined role for the new world order now. We're talking control opposition. I would say you know uh, you help us, you will we you will yeah we absolutely. promise you everything you know absolutely. sell your soul and we will give you everything. That's right. 
And uh, unfortunately, I think, uh, I know these are very, se very severe accusations, but uh, I would very much like to hear his answer to this. Right. And uh, Dr. William Pepper, has, uh, he has released a book about this thing, uh, where I believe that a lot of these details are there. As far as I know, he has not been sued or anything. And this is also standard procedure. You are met with silence, you know, wall of silence. Uh, and uh, because they know if they get into a tug of war, they lose. If they come out of, of the dark corridors, they lose because the truth will stand on its own. Anyway, so when you look at these assassinations, very often, uh, or always I would say, they do not rely on one shooter alone. Most of the time you have some kind of triangular fire. Somebody may be doing the shooting on the street level, but there are backup snipers in the neighborhood and so on. Should they fail? Should something happen? There are multiple escape cars, there are multiple shooters, there's multiple uh, walkie-talkie men, all of these things around them. So you'll see that it's like a military operation. And this time as well, there were two, at least two sniper teams on location this day. But before that, <clears throat> there was also uh, members of the Army's 111th Military Intelligence Group uh, who was on site. They came to the fire station and said, please, uh, is it okay if we, we get up on the roof of the fire station? We've got some cameras and, and uh, equipment and so on. So there were people out there filming the shooting, filming the shooters, filming the whole thing. And this, is a, this footage is... Uh, said to still be out there. Wow. But uh, also, <clears throat> uh, well, in, in the afternoon as well, during the day, King was, uh, now we're on the April the 4th, the day when everything goes down. And he was staying at the Lorraine Hotel more or less all day, or he was there all the day. In the, uh, in the, uh, during the, uh, lunch hours and so on, there was a waitress uh, that worked at uh, Jim's Grill and she was told do not serve any food on the second floor, meaning make sure that Martin Luther King is hungry because he was invited for a barbecue and at the home of reverend Samuel Billy Kyles. Okay, so because we, we need to get him out on the balcony. How to get this person out there at a specific time, this I would suggest is what they did. They arranged for this so-called barbecue at a specific time to get him out there so that there would, so everybody would be alerted at this time, the target will exit the room and uh, with the, there are always shooters and spotters, uh, radio communication and so on. So, when the, the, when the spotter get a green light, he just reports and boom, the shots are fired. So all very organized. There was a, uh, there was, like I said, there was two sniper teams and uh, uh, from the 184 uh, alpha unit. And uh, according to, to um, uh, members in the sniper team who, had later come forward because uh, there was like a cleanup operation afterwards, killing some of them, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. So two of them escaped, one to Costa Rica, one to Mexico, I believe. And from there, they, they have been giving testimony and so on. And one of them said that they had been instructed that the target must have a tie on. You know, do not fire at targets without ties. So, uh, the, the members of the King uh, group with ties were legal targets. Anyone with a target could, even if, if they missed King or, you know, like if they were looking at someone else, at least uh, it would be a, a good target. And here the people with, with ties were Albanathi, it was Andy Young and Martin Luther King. The ones without a tie was referenced Samuel Billy Kyles and Jesse Jackson. Okay, so uh, Samuel uh, Billy Kyles, he, he has made, he died this year, 
uh, just in time to get, not to get nailed for this thing, right. but he has made a whole career about him spending the last hour of Martin Luther King's life together with him in th room 306, together with Alvin Athey. Uh, they were gonna go to dinner and he makes this whole story. Alvin Athey always said, this guy is just full of it because he was not there with us. And also the surveillance shows that he arrived uh, 10 to six and not spending, he said he arrived at, fi at five o'clock and then King said, come in, sit down. And they were having this great talk uh, reference uh, together. That was absolutely not what happened, but that's the story. Actually, what uh, what um, uh, Samuel Billy Kyle's, I can send you a, a video clip that I put together of all his different statements regarding the different uh, aspects of this assassination. It's just like a clip together. And he's, he says that he arrived at four o'clock stayed in Jesse Jackson and they had to sing along with Jesse Jackson's band. I, I could guess that maybe they had a meeting in Jesse Jackson's room, but I think maybe they were preparing for something totally different than a sing along. Anyway, so Billy Cars go up there, he helps pick out, he picks out the tie, it was an uh, orange and black tie for Martin Luther King, he puts it on him and then uh, King goes out on the balcony. When he goes out there, there's Strausser, Frank Strausser, and Earl Clark. They're hit, hiding in the bushes. You've got two sniper teams, and you've got possibly uh, one more shooter uh, in another location on a high rise in building. I call it, I think it's called CP uh, Garrett Building. No, that's, that's not, yeah. Sorry, it doesn't matter. But a high building nearby, very close as well to the Lorraine Motel. So he was surrounded by snipers when he came out of the room, going to this barbecue at six o'clock. So he comes out and he goes out alone. Uh, Albanathi is back in the room uh, shaving and, Dr. Uh, and Samuel Billy Kyles claims that he was there together with, uh, with Martin Luther King on the balcony. Mm -hmm. Now, Martin King was standing on the balcony having an argument about a tie with somebody down at the parking. Who was that person? It was Jesse Jackson, where he said, come on, we invited for dinner, you know, put on a tie, where, where Jesse Jackson said, no, 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 the only thing I'll bring is a good appetite. But uh -huh. that argument kept him in position at the balcony, standing there talking to him. Then his driver said, listen, uh, Dr. King, I think it's going to be a, a chilly evening. Maybe you should bring an overcoat. So King just turns around and said, would you mind bringing my overcoat? And just when he does that, boom, the shot rang, rang out. Wow. And the official story said that King was hit right more or less on, in the jaw on the right-hand side, a massive gaping hole here, that the bullet went in here, then out and in again in the throat, and then the bullet ended up uh, near the, uh, on the back, uh, near the left shoulder blade. But I would suggest that there might be a possibility of multiple shots being fired at the same time. Because once again, we're talking about the target being to be terminated. It's the whole thing with the operation. And so very often they don't rely on just one shooter. It's like green light, boom, several shots are fired from different directions. And then because since they control the people at the emergency uh, room, right. as well as the people doing the autopsy, that is standard procedure. Right. They know that they can manipulate the wounds and the documents and so on. So they just need him dead, that's step one also. Right. So, so when, let me ask a question. This is so fascinating. You're, what, a, what an amazing research you've done. So when they shoot, they give them the, the go-ahead and they all shoot at once. So it sounds like one shot? Do you know, like when Samuel Billy Kyles tells the story, he tells it the same way again and again and again. And then he says, and then the shot rang out. Kapaya! He, he keeps saying, Kapaya! which sounds to me like that could be, yeah. you know, echo 
this yeah. could very well like if you go on YouTube you, you look for the fastest gunslinger in the West right. there's this uh, master uh, shooter uh, and what's what's shooter he fights two shots that is one of his tricks so fast that it sounds like one it's only in slow motion that you can actually see the two shots are fired so here I would say green light very possible that more than one shot was fired because the the photo from the autopsy there is no photo from the autopsy instead it's a drawing right just like they did with kennedy they made like a medical drawing and the hole looks very weird there's a massive one up here and then there's another one down on the throat and then reference sim uh, billy samuel billy kyle's keeps repeating in all the interviews and then there was an even bigger hole in the middle of his chest and he's talking about a dumb dumb bullet uh, that just ripped the whole chest out of william of uh, dr king this is not the official story at all he did not get hit in the chest at all but this is what what billy kyle's keeps saying again and again and again over the years being praised for being the one that was there as a witness to the sacrifice and carrying the dream forward and so on. Disgusting, if you ask me. Yeah. Also, what, what Billy Kyle says that um, when you look at this famous photo of uh, King when he's, when he's lying down on the right. balcony mm -hmm. and everybody's pointing, pointing towards where they said the shots were fired. For one thing, they're not pointing towards the rooming house where James Earl Ray is... Uh, and they're, point, they're pointing to this high building that I forgot the name of, the Gatby building or, or something like that. But if that is the direction they're pointing. Also, all of the people that are pointing are actually were standing with their backs towards where the shots were fired. So where did this pointing come from? And the one that came running up, uh, you will see him, there is a series of photos and the guy running up uh, covering the rooms where the invaders were staying was Jesse Jackson. And I would humbly suggest, I would maybe think that he was the one pointing in that direction, that it was like a photo set up, uh, this whole thing, to get the official story going. Also, if you remember the invaders, this group that was supporting King, right. this, these people were armed. And they were staying at the same motel, the Lorraine Motel, in room 316 and 317. And just an, about half an hour, 45 minutes before uh, the shooting of King occurred, uh, the, uh, some of the staff from the motel came and said, we're very sorry, but you need to leave the room. And they were like, but we're here, we paid for the room, why, why? And they said, no, sorry, you need to leave the room immediately. On, what, on whose order? Jesse Jackson's. Whoa. Jesse Jackson's. So they made sure that there was no armed people there that could suddenly rush out and they start a shoot down with the snipers. You know, in, in Chinese, if they ran out, shot, and it was an empty police officer they killed, or, an, uh, or a Green Beret sniper. Can you imagine what that would have started? Oh, yeah. So anyway, they, well, uh, you know, you've, you've always expressed in all these false flags. They always make sure that the shooter's safe. They'll have it in a no uh, gun-free zone or a dead-end street. That's what you've always told us about false flags. So they made sure that the invaders who were armed couldn't get involved, couldn't get any action. No, they were down in the car. I think they were just about to take off when the shots were fired. But the witnesses that were down on the parking, the driver and some other people, they saw somebody moving around in the bushy area underneath the rooming house window where it said that the, the official story said that James O. Ray had rented this room and then there was this bathroom, a tiny little bathroom where for everyone living there, uh, where he was standing up in the, in the bathtub and fired this uh, shot. It is possible to find that window, even though the angle is very strange. Only one side of the problem. There was a massive big tree right in front of this window when the shots occurred. But thank you uh, to the, thanks to the Memphis Police Department, 
they contacted the the local um, sanitation, not sanitation, but park and uh, park and recreation, uh, park depart right. department, you know? yeah, and and ordered them, please, can you please cut down all the brushes, all the trees in this area? So in the next morning, April the fifth, the whole crime scene was devastated. Jeez. They had cut down everything and there were lots and lots of footprints and every, everything was destroyed and the people from this park department they had no idea they were just giving a task they thought they were you know doing a good thing helping and sure. instead they totally destroyed the crime scene once again the very criminal behavior right that's it's amazing now tell me uh these sharpshooters uh, i've talked to you about these and how incredibly professional they are, how they work in teams, and how accurate they are. Uh, so if you think that uh, it's just happenstance that they hit them, no, they're, these guys are trained professionals. They probably grew up being groomed for the, these roles. But I, I'm re very interested in how they're managing James Earl Ray during this time. You, I'm, I'm going to get back to this because this is almost like a second chapter once we get by. Good, I, I'm the, here. We finished the, the Martin Luther King, then I'm going to say what actually was planned for James Earl Ray because that went totally bad. You know, it was not planned that what happened there. So, um, where were we? Well, well the witnesses, what the witnesses saw was that uh, one of the, uh, there was a, a white male who was moving around inside the bushes and there was something with a white sheet. Uh, either it was a white sheet hanging to dry or he was using it uh, for some protection or something like that. I mean, it would be a perfect thing to hide behind. Sure. Uh, and you, here we're talking about Frank Strauss and O'Clock, if I'm correct, these two, where as soon as the shots were fired, the, the rifle was thrown to, um, to O'Clock. He then uh, moved to the back door of Jim's grill, where Lord Jowers had testified that he received the smoking gun, brought it in there. He was observed by his girlfriend, a young black woman, only 19 years old, uh, who saw him break down the rifle and hide it. Her name was Betty Spates. And uh, that rifle was then kept there and picked up the, the, the next day uh, by Raul, this Raul person. But before then, <laughs> Lloyd Jowett had shown the rifle the next morning to one of his best friends saying, this is the one that killed King. You know, not very clever, <laughs> but I think he was a bit shocked as well. So... Yeah. Um, You're saying that they showed it to James Earl Ray? This is no, the, no, no, no. That Lloyd Jowers showed it to one of his best friends ah. that this was the rifle that killed King. And he was later, many years later, he he testified at the at the court uh, about him being shown the rifle. And this is also, I believe, what started the whole thing, uh, where William Pepper managed to get Lloyd Jowers. And the whole case was to, to uh, the whole case was to prove that there was a conspiracy, and the King family was accused that they just did it for the money. So the the whole uh, the, the what do you call it the sue involved one hundred dollars. You know that they would sue Lloyd Jarvis for being a part of this conspiracy to kill King and pay one hundred dollars so just to show that it did it had nothing to do with money. Wow. But back to the conspiracy, because uh, when you look at these very famous photos of, uh, up on the balcony where King is lying there, somebody had put a towel on his cheek where the blood is. And when you look, at, there's one woman who is standing next to the, everyone pointing. I think she's pointing as well. Uh, she's got like a, a cart next to her with, uh, it looks like for washing or towels and, and so on, on wheels. And she looks, I have never been able to identify her. She looks like she's a maid or something like that. Right. But this was six o'clock in the evening and you don't change sheets or towels at six o'clock. So what was that cart doing there? In my humble opinion, it was there supplying uh, blankets, uh, towels and so on to cover multiple wounds, right. you know? So, or 
also maybe like an injection needle, anything to make sure the king died or some weapon or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but Samuel Billy Kyles, what he also says is that there was blood everywhere. And what he did was he covered the king's body from the neck downwards with the bed spreading. I would say possibly to cover the chest wound. Right. So you're and thinking also, you're sorry. thinking that it was the chest. They hit him in the chest. That's what killed him. It was no. They the, there were multiple gun wounds, I believe. But that's my personal point. I had never heard this before. But when you listen to Billy Kyle's story, he keeps repeating the same story about a massive big wound in the chest as well, a big gaping one in the face and down on the neck, and then his whole chest being had been ripped off. This does not show up in the autopsy. It does not, not show up anywhere, but his testimony, and he was there, also covering him up. Okay. Wow. But it gets worse than this, because when, like I said before, you, you need to control both the hospital and autopsy and right. these things to make sure that you are in control. So before the, uh, the house doctor of the Dixie Mafia's godfather, Russell Atkins, he was the chief of surgery. His name was Dr. Breen Bland. And he was working at the St. Joseph's Hospital uh, in Memphis. And he had been uh, taking part of some of these meetings. And he said, whatever happens, just make sure that you bring him to my hospital and I will see to it that he does not leave alive. Oh. Okay. So normally uh, when it came, this, this St. Joseph's hospital wasn't the perfect one for bullet wounds and so on. There was another one called uh, the John Paul, uh, John, um, Another, Sorry, another there was hospital. another hospital that normally took care of these uh, type of wounds. But Samuel Billy Kyle, according to himself, is the one telling the ambulance to which hospital to go. So here we have his involvement again on a critical uh, point in this whole thing. Either the, the ambulance driver was in and knowing where to take him, or it was by direction by, once again, reference Samuel Billy Kyle, who said, I told him, told them uh, to which hospital they should take him. So Dr. King is taken to uh, St. Joseph's uh, Hospital and he's still alive. He did not die on the balcony. He's still alive. He's breathing, steady pulse, but with massive, massive uh, uh, wounds Ooh, to his right. face and neck and so on. So he's taken him uh, to the emergency ward and <clears throat> And there, uh, there's uh, the, the people working there. Of course, they, they do everything they can to save him. When this Dr. Breen Brand comes in with two people in suits, and he says, uh, sorry for the language, stop working on that nigger and let him die. Then he then orders everyone out of the room. And there's one nurse called uh, Lula May, um, Sorry, once again, uh, but anyway, um, she said that when she was about to leave the room, she heard that the three men spat on King while he was still alive. And then, so she turned around hearing that, and then she saw Dr. Breen Bland take a pillow and put it over the face of Dr. Martin King and hold it there until he stopped breathing. Wow, whose testimony is this again? This is eyewitness testimony, right? It's that it's this, uh, the witness is the son of this uh, nurse uh, who said that when she came home, she was totally shaken and she told her family uh, all of this, but she was always too afraid to go public with this. Oh, of course. And, uh, Amazing. But when you, when you know how these uh, things are carried out, then this makes perfect sense. This is how they do it. There. And uh, and by the way, the sniper teams, I forgot to say, they were, it was an Alpha 184 unit from Camp Shelby in, in Mississippi. Uh, and the orders were given, as far as, far as I know, uh, by General William Yardborough. 
I have photos of him and JFK. Wow. I mean, can you imagine? And uh, so. So these weren't ma so these weren't mafia shooters. These were they, army but, people. But th this is the thing. It's getting a bit complicated here because either we're looking at one shot or we're looking at several different shots fired. I would say sev several different shots fired sure. because okay. also uh, the rifle that was used by Frank Strausser, according to witnesses that saw the rifle and so on, was quite an advanced rifle that could be taken apart, just like Lloyd Jowers did. And Frank Strausser was... Uh, he was uh, practicing the whole of April 3rd and the 4th before this whole thing happened. And after the assassination, he almost started behaving like, uh, well, he could be the Dirty Harry character, you know, the guy that just does whatever he wants. He pulls out his gun, right. he kills people right, left and center without having to fear anything. He had prostitutes in the back of his cab once he got dismissed from the police station and never fearing to get uh, uh, any problems, you know. This, but this is also standard. The people involved in these things are untouchables and they know it. They know it. Well, they're untouchable by everybody except the control system. When the control system wants them out of there because they might present a leak, they're gone. I'll bet you that's what happened to uh, Hoover. He just knew too much. This is the thing. When you, when you, um, the House Select Committee of, of um, I'm sorry, it's like 45 degrees here. I know, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, for sure, there's so many people. Uh, Sam Giancarna, Johnny Rosselli, when uh, Giancarna was shot in the head, Hoover died of a so called heart attack, was buried right away, Clay Shaw. Same thing, you know, no autopsy, buried, gone. Uh, Johnny Rosselli ended up in a, in a barrel in, in uh, the Hudson Bay, I think, you know, chopped into small little pieces. Th this is the thing that happened. It's a very brutal world they live in. They live by the gun, they die by the gun, type of thing. Amazing. But there are some very odd things here that I want to use and then get into the whole James Ray. If you can bear with me. I'm, I'm with it. you. I'm, I'm, I'm captivated. Totally captivated. Okay, okay so when James Earl Ray, uh, the thing was that he said that he uh, was instructed by Raul to bring the gun to this rooming house. He was there. He rented the room, the Bessie, uh, um, uh, the rooming house, the boarding house. Uh, he was the, He rented the room and he was instructed, you know, to... Uh, to come there, bring the gun, and so on, because the, Raul was going to meet a, a gun dealer, and this was just like a sample. And then Raul tried to get rid of him. He, he tried to get him to go to the cinema and so on, but uh, James Earl Ray didn't. Instead, he said he left just about six. He, uh, he took off in, in this Mustang, this pale white Mustang, and uh, he, was, uh, he had a flat tire, so he went to a... Um, a service station right. asking if they could please fix the tire. They said, sorry, we've got too much uh, going on at the moment. Please come back tomorrow. So he turned around and starts driving back to the rooming house where he suddenly sees that there are police cars coming. You know, So he's being a fugitive. He thought, shit, I'm out right. of here. So he turned around and just uh, started speeding up. And then uh, he heard on the radio that King had been shot. You know, he didn't really think so much of it, he said. But then he heard that they were looking for a white male in a white Mustang. And he thought, whoa, yeah. not the best place to be. Right. So he thought, this might be me they're looking for. So it's it's difficult with James Earl Ray because he, it was very obvious that he did not tell the whole truth. He was giving bits and pieces not to incriminate himself and also to stay alive in prison. He was stabbed once, you know, and not it's a dangerous place to start naming names in high positions and so on so right. this is why you can see how he's manipulating and and, and doing stuff and facts and so on anyway but uh, when he when he got the car it seems like he was he was flown from atlanta to montreal uh, by a pilot called jules rico kimball this man is also uh, 
according to his own account, one of the people that flew some of the shooters out from Dili Plaza to Montreal as well. That was a very strong, uh, a stronghold of, of the mafia and the CIA in Montreal. So the same same pilot being used there. So we're looking at the same team once again. And and um, uh, Rico Kimball, he says also that he believes that he might be part of the Raoul character in Montreal because some of the things that he did. But this car that he was driving, James O'Reilly, this pale uh, yellow uh, Ford Mustang in 66, it was found. And one of the officers that went there, that was told, uh, it was an FBI agent called Don Wilson. He was instructed, please check out the car and see if you find anything. And when he was checking out, he was on the right-hand side of the car. He opened the door and there was this, uh, I think it was an envelope that fell out. And he picked it up and, and I think he thought, oh my God, I put my fingerprints on it. That's no good. So he just, he didn't think it was of any importance. So he just uh, stuck it in his pocket and didn't say anything about it. But once he came home, uh, or later, uh, he found that, that there was a, a piece of a 1963 Dallas, te Texas telephone di directory. And written on the pages were the name Raul and the initial J and a phone number. When he called that phone number, it turned out that it was a night to a nightclub run by Jack Ruby. Oh. Jack Ruby. The plot thickens. And a second piece of paper had a list of names with amounts of money beside each. So Wilson, he just freaked out and he thought, what am I going to do? I can't tell anyone. And, and if I hand this in, it's going to just disappear. So he, he kept it for like 20, I think 29 years before he gave it to the King family and so on. But this Raul person uh, was later identified by Be Beverly Oliver, you know, one of the, the babushka lady, one of uh -huh. the witnesses to the JFK assassination, and two other women who had seen Raul together with Jack Ruby at the Carousel Club. So here we have a direct connection once again. Uh -huh. And I have another witness who claims that one of the handlers while James Earl Ray was on the run was a man called Charles Frederick Rogers. Now, Charles Frederick Rogers was working for the ONI, ONI, the Naval Intelligence, and he is, when you look at the photos of the three tramps from Dealey Plaza, he's the guy walking first in line, a dark-haired guy also called Frenchie. That's Charles Frederick Rogers. And this witness also claims that uh, one of the drivers from the shooting of JFK was also driving around with James Earl Ray during these eight months. His name was uh, um, Ronald uh, Otis, Ronald Otis. And he was, uh, his sister used to call him Raul. And he might also be part of this Raul co composite, I think. Anyway, so. You know, what, um, you know what, I'm the, sitting here. Are, go, you, go ahead. I mean, I'm just reflecting. No, it sounds. Yeah, I think that. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I think that the Raúl in Montreal, his name was Raúl Miori. He was specializing in false identities, Raúl Miori. But then there was another Raúl called Cuello, uh, and there was another one called Raúl Escovade. Uh, like um, he had uh, when. When James Earl Ray was on his way to Memphis, he had made a phone call to Raoul. And uh, so uh, when the first lawyer was given to, to James Earl Ray, they were trying, the first one was trying to, to do good, you know. Mm -hmm. So he hired a private detective to find if they could find this mysterious Raoul. And so James Earl Ray told exactly where he made the phone call from because uh, the, the pay phone did not work. It was in a small town in Texas somewhere. The small, uh, the pay phone didn't work. So he used a private line, a private uh, telephone. So this private eye managed to find the, the bill, the telephone bill, and he saw, so he got the number. And when he called the guy, uh, the number, it was to the Louisiana State Police. He asked for Raul, and a man called, came to the uh, phone called Raul Escobale. Oh. 
he na- later had a meeting with him and he said it was very obvious that both they was very aware of why they were meeting this guy was in his early 60s he had like uh, uh, salt and pepper hair very dark complexion but very ice cold blue eyes gray blue eyes and uh, this private eye said that he was afraid of this person and, and he knew that uh, right. we need to be very careful here so there's several different of, of these roles and i think these are the ones that this composite is is made of anyway so are you ready for the James Earl Ray part of the whole thing? Yeah, that's what I was waiting for. How are they managing this patsy? <laughs> that's amazing. Oh my God, it's uh, it's a hell of a story. Okay, some years after this happened, there was a man called Jim Green that came forward and said, I was involved in the, JFK, in the Martin Luther King assassination. Nobody took him serious. He, he, made the, he testified before the House Select Committee of Conspiracy, no, oh my God, the House Select Committee that looked into the JFK, Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy assassinations and so on. He, he uh, uh, testified before them and he even made contact and met Dexter King one of the sons of Martin Luther King telling his story. Okay, his story is that he was, he believed that he was handpicked because he was in prison at the same time as James Earl Ray. This guy was like a, just a street thug into bootlegging and, and stealing cars and these type of things, not at all involved with things like this. But these are sometimes the people used for these operations to pull the trigger and then they, they kill them right away and bury them, yeah. you know. So anyway, he was, uh, he believed that he was chosen because he knew James Earl Ray, what he looked like and so on from prison. They were at the Missouri State Prison at the same time. And he was uh, approached by a man called Paul, which he claims is the same person as Raul. So I'm going to call him Raul from now on, not to confuse right. the whole thing. Okay. so. Uh, when it, on April 3rd, the day before the assassination, they were, they were asked to come, they were asked to buy some rifles and uh, get a white Mustang 66 and come to Memphis. And uh, Raul met them in their hotel room and he said, he gave them uh, an envelope with $5,000 and he said that, uh, this is for you to kill James Earl Ray tomorrow. There's another five waiting for you when the job is done. So this man, Jim Green, had no idea about the, the whole operation, that King was there, that anything else was going on, and this is also standard procedure. Sure. Anyway, so this Jim, he had a, a partner, called, partner in crime called Butch Collier, and they stalked Ray in the early afternoon after they found him at the at, uh, Jim's Grill. And uh, you can also hear the testimony of James Earl Ray. He said that there were some, uh, some strange people watching him while he was in Memphis that day that, that freaked him out. These are the two I would suggest that were there. And so the whole idea was that Raul told them that James Earl Ray at the time of the assassination would be instructed to go to Jim's Grill and do a robbery, pull off a robbery. Then when he left the Jim's Grill, there would be a police officer uh, standing there waiting for him with a 357 Magnum. Uh, and this police officer, should he fail to kill, he would just kill uh, James Earl Ray there and then because they didn't want a new James uh, Lee Harvey uh, situation. They want that on the spot. Should uh, something happen and this police officer fail, then Green was to be positioned on a rooftop on the other side of the street to the boarding house. Okay, so there are snipers towards Lorraine Hotel, but there's also a sniper on the other side of the street 
uh, on the other side of the boarding room, that is sort of like one parallel street further up. Okay, and he doesn't know about the rest of the operation. So uh, the Memphis police detective, his name is John Talley, uh, he was the guy that was to kill James Earl Ray, and the, the caliber of the rifle that was given to Jim Green was a 357 as well. So the two cameras would fit, you know. So even if two shots were fired, or being pointed towards uh, the police officers. Um, Oli, we're gonna. I'm gonna have to need you to repeat that story because we had a bad Skype connection. So the, the go back to where. Uh -huh. Where they're committing the, they're ordered to, to hold up a, what they were ordered to do a a, a robbery. Okay. And it was James Earl Ray, was one of the people that were ordered to do this robbery. No. Yeah, but but do you want to call again to get a better connection? Or yeah, let's time? let's do that. Let's do that. So you were telling a fascinating <laughs> story about uh, Raúl setting up this. Uh, heist of some kind. To the whole of... idea okay. from their point of view was to kill James Earl Ray and not have a repetition of the Lee Harvey Oswald syndrome where suddenly you have somebody that is not killed because Lee Harvey Oswald was also planned to be assassinated on site. You know, they want them dead right away so that they can bury the whole story and that people will not look into it. And here, they did not want a repetition. So James Earl Ray is not supposed to leave that location alive. So the plan they had was <clears throat> um, they gave him, there were three white Mustangs involved, one of them pale yellow, uh, which is the one that uh, James Earl Ray bought. Right. Uh, the idea was that get James Earl Ray to go to Jim's Grill and at least attempt a, po uh, a robbery there. That was Raul's plan. Then when he left Jim's Grill, a police officer uh, by the name of John Talley would be standing outside with a 357 and shoot him dead. That, you know, so right. he, that means that he would uh, he would have been, uh, you know, been a possible shooter from the bushes or the r rooming house, and then coming through uh, the back of James Grill into the restaurant or from the outside into the restaurant, whatever, and then be killed there so that they had multiple options of explanations to what he was doing there, you know. But yeah. the whole idea was to kill him on location. And then Raul who was in uh, the rooming house together with this Butch Collier, they uh, would then run, as soon as the shots were fired at King, they would run down with a bundle of evidence uh, that was put in a blanket. I mean, this was the most incredible stuff that was in that. It was the rifle, the Remington Game Master that was stuffed into a, 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 a package that didn't even fit the rifle. There was the, the radio from the Missouri State Prison that James Earl Ray used to work, used to have there. I mean, so they think that he, he made an escape from prison, bringing his ra radio. radio, and then all the way there with the serial number engraved on the backside. They were like bobby pins. There were, M there were beer cans with his fingerprints on. There were clothes that didn't fit him but that belonged to him. Do you know, like all yeah. of that just to point him out. And Raul's uh, idea was to throw this in the the back seat of the Mustang so that he would be killed down uh, at the grill. Evidence would be found in the car, and that that was the whole idea. They had parked. There were three different uh, Mustangs involved, and you can see <clears throat> there's one cab driver who testified. He he came. Uh, to pick up a client at the, uh, the rooming house. Uh, he was later the guy that pointed out to James O'Reilly as the shooter, even though he was so drunk he couldn't even get out of bed. Uh, so the cab driver went up there, he was in the room, uh, and saw that uh, Charles Stevens was lying there, dead drunk, left, got in the cab, 
and went back to the cab station. Once he arrived there, he heard on the radio that King had been shot. So he was there uh, just around with this whole thing, uh, the shooting took place. And he noticed that there were two white Mustangs 1966 on the outside. I mean, this was a, almost a new car then. This yeah. was, uh, and a muscle car, so you noticed them. Right. And here there were two more or less identical standing outside here. Now, the idea was to leave one uh, to blame uh, James L. Rea, and then Raul would take another one that was parked a block further, uh, further down, and then uh, Butch Collier would take the third one, take off, and then pick up uh, Jim Green as well, the shooter that they had placed on the other side of the street. So that they were sort of decoys, confusing the whole situation. Amazing. This is also standard procedure. So the idea was to get uh, James L. Ray killed on site. And this is why they paid Jim Green $5,000 to get up on the roof on the other side of the street as a sniper with a rifle, a 357 9 just like the same caliber as the police officer, so that there would be whoever shot him, as long as he died, if they could, they could always blame it on, or say that it was the police officer that had killed him. And nobody would ever know that there was a shooting on the roof. So he was there from like three, uh, three in the afternoon, several hours, you know, really uncomfortable for him and so on. But he said that he was standing, uh, he was on the roof and he saw James O'Reilly come in and out several times and standing by the, the Mustang for quite a long time, a long time going into the room, he was going out. And I think maybe he was sort of suspecting that there's something strange going on here. At the same time, Raul said, uh, he claims that Raul wanted him to go to the cinema. And the cinema is also a classical point either for the target of an assassination or for anyone who wants to be blamed for it because then the people that carry out the operation know for sure that that person will be in the same location for at least an hour, an hour and a half if they don't leave in the middle of the film. So it's a perfect location to keep one um, sort of isolated, but without him knowing it. They did the same thing with Oswald, didn't they? They put one of Oswald they, they had, doubles in there. And it, yes it and no. It was the Texas Theater there, but that was, was where he was told to go to meet his controller. And uh, But similar thing, because they used to meet, I believe, in the Texas Theater. So he was, he, he was told to go there after the, this whole thing for... for an update of, of instructions, and but he never, the, his handler never arrived, and his handler was David Atley Phillips, the same person in, in charge of Operation Forty as well. So, so what they saw was instead, <clears throat> you have this mysterious bundle that was found just outside the entrance of the the, uh, the house next to uh, the rooming house and uh, Jim Grill. It was called the Canopy Amusement, and it, some, it, it was just thrown on the, on the pavement, which has always struck me as very odd, you know, and also very odd that James L. Ray was allowed to go on, a, on an international escape, uh, you know, thing where he went to Portugal, he went to England, he went to, he was on his way to Belgium, and he was in the UK, he was, got arrested at Heathrow, you know, such an uncertain thing when you want case closed quickly. Right. So this thing, I would say, it explains the whole thing. And so what uh, Jim Green was telling, that he was up on the rooftop waiting for, for James Earl Ray to come and shoot him. And then he saw that James Earl Ray, just before six, got in the car and just took off. And so total confusion. And then the, he heard the shots fired, uh, and then he saw uh, Butch Collier and Raul coming running out uh, from the, bo the boarding room. Raul with this bundle of crap. And since the car was gone, they were sort of like, what the hell are we going to do? So he just dropped it on, on payment, 
jumped into the car, they jumped, both jumped into the other white Mustang, took off. Um, Butch then turned around and dropped uh, Raul off by the third white Mustang and then drove to pick up uh, Jim Green that had, by then had uh, uh, climbed down and, uh, from the roof and so on. So, wow. So the evidence, the bundle of evidence, they just dropped on the pavement? The, the one, uh, the evidence that was supposed to uh, point to James Earl Ray? Yeah, it was just part, and it's very strange because several different, there, I think there are two or three different police officers that all, all claim to be the ones that found it. So I think there might have been mul multiple bundles, uh, you know, oh. just to make absolutely sure that they would frame James Earl Ray. Because one of the police officers, he said that he came running, uh, he passed the boarding house and he ran into Jim's grill and he said to, to the people there, please, uh, something awful has happened, stay in here, don't move, and so on. And then he ran out again, and when he came out, this bundle was right there in front of him. And he said, it wasn't there when I went in, and he was only in there for like 10, 15 seconds. But this is at the exact same time when Raul and, and Butch came running out, dropped it, and then jumped in the car and took off. Amazing. Amazing. So not only is the hit orchestrated, <clears throat> with mostly inside people, but also the patsy is orchestrated <clears throat> because the patsy has to be killed too. Unfortunately, or fortunately, he wasn't. No, it made it really made a massive mess, you know, because he could identify Raúl. He could uh, he knew key people, you know, so he was a threat to the whole thing, and. Uh, so it would have been so much easier. Can you imagine if he, he was shot dead there? Right away, he was the guy that shot. Right. Killed, he was killed on sight by a heroic police officer. And that was it. A redneck, uh, low-life thug who just killed him because he hated blacks. Yeah. And that was it. End of story. That was the plan. And instead, it's come to this massive big thing that has taken so many years to expose. Right. You know, what amazes me, Oli, is that you you started with the Kennedy assassination, then you branched, branched off into other false flags. This looks like a, a serial murder. You know, like um, uh, there was a general, what's his name, uh, Clark. Uh, remember, you'll, you'll remember this, when he said, uh, we're going to invade, invade six countries, or five seven countries, com seven, seven countries. countries in five years. Right. It sounds like the same kind of deal. We're going to knock off uh, John F. Kennedy. We're going to knock off his brother. We're going to knock off Malcolm X, and we're going to take out uh, Martin Luther King. It sounds like the same players, the same organization. What do you think? I don't know how many times I say it's the same, the same, the same, it's the same, the same, and the same in different variations. But right. the key players are very often the very same people that follow the same template. And and it's just a study of how to carry them these things out. It's like if I if I was a if I were a violent person or into these things, I, I could be hired to, to arrange for these type of things, you know, because with my knowledge, I know exactly how they pull them off. I know exactly which things to, to have in, in mind, what you need to be aware of, who do you need to take care of, how to carry it out in a professional way, and so on. And here we're looking at top, top, top people in the military, in the intelligence agencies, and so on. I mean, who am I? I'm just an ordinary guy on the street trying to to figure these things out. But these people are, are, are professionals. So for them, this is, uh, you know, a walk in the park. Right. Well, you're anything but an ordinary, ordinary guy. You don't realize <laughs> how hard it is to do the depth of research that you do. And this might be a great time to mention that if you're interested in what Oli does, and I don't know anybody that's a awake and aware today that wouldn't be interested. He's going to be appearing in Dallas in November at the JFK Assassination Conference. And I, I was amazed. The first time I heard Ollie 
was on Red Ice Radio, and he did, oh, must have done three hours on the JFK assassination and the level of detail to the weapons, to the cars used, to how each individual group of assassins was set up, how that's, it was, it blew me away, and that's why I had to, had to have him on as a regular interviewer <laughs> here. Uh, but if you're around Dallas or you're interested in the JFK assassination, it would be well worth your while to get there in November. Um, and, and I want to say another thing about that, too. Ollie is an independent investigator, and he's broken down so many false flags for us on World Beyond Belief. It's, it's unbelievable. He's put forth a template on how this thing goes. He's an amazing researcher. And, but you don't get paid big bucks to be a researcher if you're an independent researcher. So luckily, to get Ollie to Dallas, someone gave him a plane ticket and a couple days worth of hotel rooms. But he's short about five days worth of hotel rooms. So if anybody out there is going to Dallas or is interested in helping Oli stay there more than two days and leave, I guess, uh, or sleep in the park, uh, I would like you to go to Oli's website and uh, Oh, all these websites is a potpourri of stuff. You can buy music there. You can buy books there. Uh, Ollie, tell them a little bit about your website so we can get them there to maybe get some money for you to go to Dallas. Stay in Dallas. It is uh, it is number one on my bucket list, you know, to go to Dallas. I spent so many years. Uh, I know every grass straw on Dealey Plaza, every angle, all of these things, to be able to go there is just mind-boggling. And for me also to meet these incredible researchers, there's going to be 30 speakers of an incredible magnitude uh, at that conference. So it, it's a fantastic thing for me. But like you said, uh, I've been given a plane ticket, I'm, there's two nights at a hotel and a hundred dollars, that's it. And uh, as you know, Things cost more than that. Right. Uh, I would, so I would be extremely grateful if this could be like an exchange of energy. I put 30 years into these things. If other people who appreciate the truth coming out would like to support me, uh, their donation buttons on my website, lightonconspiracies.com, lightonconspiracies.com. There's more than one, if you haven't noticed. Uh, also sign up for my newsletter, uh, there's a membership area and so on. I'm a one-man band, so this is the only income I have, and that would uh, help me to spend a few days in Dallas. Also, uh, as part of making a documentary series, I am uh, where I'm financing it myself, but going on many, many, I've been to eight or ten locations now where the East Force Flag operation has been carried out, filmed it in all the different uh, angles all so that I can put together a documentary series of 13 to 15 programs where uh, you show I show the official version and then boom I show this type of research that will in my opinion will blow blow people away because it's just so powerful when you put the two next to each other and you see the the depth of deception and the the power of the truth, what the truth can do. Right. So please, I, uh, I'm not begging, but I'm <laughs> asking, support me in doing this, because I'm doing it for all of us. We're in the same boat, all of us. Right. And the reason why these assassinations, to reveal what's going on, is so important, is because the power structure that killed these beautiful people are still in place. This is the thing, this is why nothing changes, even though you change the, the face of the president. The same agenda keeps going on. And we need to reveal that to be able to transcend this whole thing and get to the next level. That's right. Can I just mention another thing uh, regarding this, uh, uh, this assassination? There was a judge called Joe Brown, and he was a part of the, uh, to a certain extent, to the trial of the James Earl Ray. 
And he, I don't know where he got the information from, but he said that there was an additional sniper team inside the fire station in the cafeteria near the dormitory. And he said that they used the cafeteria table, a stationary table, put the rifle on there, opened the window. And so the team was, uh, the two-man shooter team was inside the building, but they were shooting out through a little opening in the window. And he claimed that the murder weapon, I mean, this is possibly the, the chest wound we're talking about now, since that is the one that, uh, that hit so accurate, whereas the other ones were sort of like a bit, right. it, it maybe it came moved or something like that, but it was not a perfect shot. If there was one or two shots in the face area. He claimed that the rifle you were converted to M14, it was an XM21 with a NATO caliber 7.62, with a special stainless steel barrel. It had a Redfield 3 x 9 telescopic sight, modified by a company called Leatherwood. And it also had a special subsonic ammunition with a suppressor to reduce the velocity of the bullet uh, to below supersonic. And th the reason for this was to confuse the sound signal so that it would be harder to track where the, the shot came from. Because especially in, in uh, uh, city, uh, locations, when a bullet is fired, it will sound like pop, 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 be, when it comes to between the buildings and so on, it will be easier for witnesses to hear from what direction it came from. So here they fired it at a lower uh, velocity to avoid that thing. Amazing. So, well, that's totally and amazing. he said also, I want to point out that he said that this rifle it was a special sniper rifle. It was top of the line at that time. And that it was part of the FBI inventory, of the FBI inventory in late 1967. It was one of five rifles. And after the assassination, when uh, uh, they were trying to, to use these rifles, get them transported to Vietnam to be used there, one of them was missing. Uh. And it was, it was marked either destroyed or missing. So, wow, that's amazing, amazing information, amazing information. Well, that's all the time we have today. Thank you very much, Oli. I want to congratulate you again on your Prague Peace Prize of 2016. <laughs> that's no little accomplishment. And uh, let's all work together to try to get some money to Oli uh, so that he can have a comfortable stay in Dallas. And if you're around there, that that would be I would be there if I lived anywhere within a hundred miles because there's there's gonna be amazing speakers. There's gonna be E. Howard Hunt's son, St. John, he's gonna be there. Gary Powers, do you remember the guy who flew the U two mm -hmm. plane and was shot down? Right. Uh, possibly due to Lee Harvey Oswald's uh, information in Russia. His son is gonna be there, uh, uh, Gary Powers Jr. There's going to be um, uh, one of JFK's uh, Secret Service uh, agents, Abraham Bolden. He was the first, first black uh, Secret Service agent, personally uh, um, sort of appointed by JFK, and later t really betrayed and put through absolute hell. He's going to be there. Jim Morris is going to be there. Judy's Very Baker is going to be there. There's going to be 30 speakers, and uh, it's just, uh, I, I can't believe that I'm going to be part of them. It's oh, just going to, for me... It wouldn't be complete without you, Oli. <laughs> You're, you've done such great work in, uh, on this subject. It wouldn't be complete without you. Lots of luck there, and I'm looking forward to talking to you after you finish that conference. You're going to be, your head's going to be so full of having been to Dallas mm -hmm. and having heard all these speakers. It's just going to be swimming. It's probably going to take you uh, a week of just letting the stuff absorb before you can really get back on the... I, I just want to mention that uh, I've been warned about coming to the U.S. Uh, I've been offered uh, one of these orange overalls and a nice stay at Cuba for a nice holiday in. And uh, I'm just going to say that uh, I come in peace. I, I only... there. I have not broken any laws. The only thing I come with is the truth and that is not breaking any laws. And should I not arrive in Dallas, 
it is because something like this has happened. Otherwise, I would be there for sure. And uh, uh, Alfred, I was on La Alfred uh, Labermont's Weber's, uh, he, he made an interview with me. He said, according to international law, there's nothing they can use against me. There's nothing, no loopholes, no nothing that can stop them from having me go there. So I just want to point that out now that please don't even try because it's just going to mess things up. Right. You know, I'm, I've got backup of very beautiful people that will make uh, a hell of a, a, a turbulence around this thing should I not be allowed to enter or taken or whatever. So I'm going to look forward to an amazing few days or a week in Dallas. I hope to die. I'm sure everything will be fine. Well, thank you very much, Oli. And uh, you can go and jump in a cold shower now and, uh, and relax. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.